Where were you born? I don't know. Fancy not knowing where you were born. Well, I was too young to remember. Stan Laurel was born Arthur Stanley Jefferson on the 16th of June 1890 in Ulverston, Lancashire. His first place of residence was number 3 Argyle Street. There have already been several documentaries, radio shows and books dedicated to the life and work of Laurel and Hardy. Our aim in this film is to offer just a sample of why we consider Stan Laurel a comedy genius. He was a genius because he, he knew what made people laugh. Stan came from a theatrical background. His father, Arthur Jefferson, or AJ as he was more well known, managed music halls around the country. It was in the music halls that Stan learnt and practised his craft and began his comedy career. His dad didn't want him to go on the stage or to be a, don't, don't be a comedian's son, there's no money in it, go into management. But Stan was determined from day one. His aim in life was to make people laugh. And it's his experiences on the stage that... that that Stan brings forward into the films and, and makes them so, uh, so fantastic. It was merely by chance that Stan Laurel appeared on screen with his future partner Oliver Hardy. It was in the 1921 film Lucky Dog where they shared their first ever scene together. It's said that a genius takes 10,000 hours to create, and um, that's true with Stan Laurel. He's absolutely born a, a comedy genius, but of course he's, he's had a 20-year apprenticeship from his first performances on stage in Glasgow at 16 to 1927 when the Laurel and Hardy partnership gets going. Stan and Ollie continued to work on their separate solo film careers for the next few years. By 1927, they were both employed by Hal Roach Studios in Culver City, Los Angeles. It was Hal Roach who made the decision to team them both as a comedy duo. Neither Stan nor Ollie were keen on this decision, but being under contract by the studios, they reluctantly agreed. Their first official film after teaming was Duck Soup, which featured a story originally written by Stan's father, AJ. The film was later reworked as another fine mess. Oh, Agnes, call me a cab. Huh? Call me a cab. You're a cab. On the telephone. If you study his earlier silent films, uh, you'll see that there's a lot of visual humour in there, a lot of pantomime humour. I think this came from his, his formative years when he was playing noisy music halls where the comedy had to be more visual rather than vocal. If you look at some of the silent films, the visual comedy within them, like Wrong Again, where you've got the interaction with the horse. Or you Darn Tootin' again, which was a silent film but based on playing in an orchestra. So a lot of the comedy had to be visual, but I think as they developed and as the talkies came along, and the fact that Lois was born, Stan developed and grew as a comedy genius. He was a born comedian. It was in his blood. He, his aim in life was to make people laugh. He was never, never jealous of his laughs. He wanted the films to be funny, not about Stan Laurel. He wanted the comedy there.
Thank you. It was during their time at the Roach Studios where Laurel and Hardy produced their most memorable work. It was at a time where Stan was given the freedom to put all his comedy talents to great use. I mean, Hal Roach um, gave Stan the free hand and the, the free budget, really. They could do what they wanted. Somewhere... An electric chair is waiting. And the great thing is, when, when, he, when he met uh, Babe, Oliver Hardy, um, he knew that, that Babe's talent as well, and he was able to work with uh, Babe, with East Talent, and they both worked well together. Um, and they, they were like two, two peas in a pod. Not pot. Pod. Pod. Of course, when he got working with Oliver, Oliver was the perfect, perfect partner for him. They worked so well. There was never any jealousy between them. You often found with a lot of, um, even today, modern double acts, there's always jealousy of the laugh. People are terrified that somebody's going to get a bigger laugh than they are. Whereas that never happened with Lauren Hardy. All they wanted was the laugh. They didn't care who got it. The genius of Stan was that he didn't think he was a genius. Many years later, watching the films back, he would often comment how funny Babe Hardy was. He really was a funny fellow. But he never laughed at himself, not as we laugh at him. And he knew what made it work, and if it worked better with James Finlayson delivering the gag or doing the scene, that's what they did, they put him in. And Stan and Babe would have to react to that to get an extra laugh out of it. But it was always worth it because they get so many laughs out of it. Hal Roach always used to say it was great because you could get three three laughs out of a scene. Because you could get Oliver Hardy or Stan doing something funny. Then you would cut to the other member and get a laugh from his reaction. Then you'd go back to either Stan or Babe and get their reaction. So you get three laughs. And timing. His timing was immaculate. He understood the camera so well. He worked on stage, of course, came through the stage in musicals. But he understood the camera and the workings of films. And his timing was immaculate. And that's what made Lauren Hardy better and funnier than so many other comedians. Have a cigarette. <laughs> The fascinating thing was, of course, you've got the, the early days of the slapstick movies, the Keystone Cops, very fast, very frenetic. It doesn't matter uh, in a silent movie because the audience can all be laughing at different stuff and nobody misses a gag. A stand-up comedian on the stage, when the audience is laughing, he stops talking and he allows them to stop laughing before he, he starts talking again. He doesn't waste a, a joke that way. Of course, how do you do that without the feedback straight from the audience? Stan used to go and watch the films, didn't you, to see how the audience laughed and then they'd know how long they did it would be. In fact, in his early days, he would take a film into a local cinema and would time how long people actually laughed at the joke. So he could edit the film, give people time to finish laughing at that joke before the next joke started. And it was so clever, simple, but clever. He took the films into the cinema, he listened to an audience watching his films and he used to jot down with a stopwatch and a pencil and paper how long an audience would laugh for and then he went back and he re-edited the film to allow that space for the audience to, to have enjoyed the joke before he starts the next joke. Now we all know Stan held the camera so well 
and it's the encouraging Oliver to look into the camera. People didn't look into the camera. When Laurel and Hardy first started, the early comedy films were fast and furious and slapstick. Stan didn't like slapstick. He didn't want slapstick. He wanted subtlety. He wanted timing. He wanted people to be able to laugh at the joke. Do you want me to get my throat cut? No. Well, then don't go to sleep. Well, I can't tell when I'm asleep. That's why I want you to stay awake, so that you can see that you're not asleep. Well, I couldn't help it. I was dreaming I was awake. And then I woke up and found myself asleep. <clears throat> Stan worked extremely hard, both on and off screen, from something as simple as his unique style of dancing. to his most wonderful and beautiful singing voice, which sometimes annoyed Ollie. Come in. La, 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 Hello, Ollie. Well, do you know that you've got a nice voice? Oh, I had a much nicer voice till I ran a nail through it. I remember... You ran a nail through it. La, da, 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 I'm singing this song. You know, I'm not as dumb as you look. You bet your life you're not. Anybody that could think. What do you mean you are not as dumb as I look? Go down in Stan the certainly wasn't as dumb as Ollie looked. His off-screen talent was occasionally seen on screen. I've certainly got to hand it to you. For what? Well, for the meticulous care with which you have executed your finely formulated machinations in extricating us from this devastating dilemma. What people don't realise, of course, is that, that Stan Laurel, this fool of a character, hid a comedy genius. Stan wasn't an, uh, just an actor, he was a writer, a director, he was a, uh, he, he was in, had a hand in absolutely everything that Laurel and Hardy did. Stan Laurel had a cot at the studio and would spend the night at the, uh, when they were making the films, he would spend the night thinking of ideas, waking up, writing them down, and he would be there the next morning before anyone else was there to, to get the films, uh, to get the films going. What did you strike that match for? I want to see if the switch was off. That's a good idea. He absolutely crafted these films. Every second of the films, Stan had a hand in, in making. Um, he was a, a fantastic writer, editor, director, uncredited, because it didn't matter to Stan. He didn't need the plaudits, he didn't need the recognition, he didn't need the awards. The money wasn't even important to him particularly. The thing that drove Stan was the laughter, and, uh, and, and that's what stands out. He worked twice as hard, he got paid more than Ollie, uh, but he loved doing it. He really was, um, you know, uh, fantastic. What you doing up there? I'm waiting for a streetcar. Stan was keen on the directing of the films. And he, knew Ollie, Ollie, he knew all he wanted was a keen golfer. And as soon as filming was finished, he wanted to go on the golf course. So if the shooting was overrunning, Stan always shot the scenes of Ollie looking frustrated. <laughs> At the end of yeah. the day, when he knew that Ollie wanted to yeah, go on the golf course. <laughs> One of the actors, Henry Brandon, was saying that. Um, after they begin the script, Sam would say, oh, you say this, I'll say that, Ollie will say that, you say this, and uh, then right, get up, and Henry Brandon said, um, aren't we going to rehearse it? 
and Stan said, you don't want to spoil it, do you? <laughs> and that's, so they can't, Stan was always looking for the freshness. He didn't want the material to be over-rehearsed and killed, because that won't, that loss of spontaneity, the humour of the moment, the great thing, because quite often the first take is always the best, so you might as well go with the first take anyway. Not only was he a genius, he was also a perfectionist. Often after the films had finished, Stan would work long into the night editing the films. Stan was working until about 2am, 2, 2 because they all were, Ch Charlie Chase and a few others. They are all tossing around ideas and it didn't matter where the humorous idea came from. They'd start on that and then embellish it and then shoot it and it'd move on to the next film. The father bear said, Oh, he's been sitting in my chair, I should like to know. And the mother bear said, Oh, he's been sitting in my chair, I should like to know. And the baby bear said, I should like to know. He drew upon other um, ideas um, from his Carno days. Um, but, you know, he, he, he created the comedy we see on screen and it's still as relevant today, it's still as funny today. It sure is. The genius of Stan Laurel was that his comedy was timeless. He did not use political jokes. He did not use jokes that would reference the era in which we were made. So if we were to watch one today, we would still understand the humour, unlike many of the films of the era. And that's because... Lol and Hardy Humour is based on human characteristics, everything that we can identify in yeah, humans. Really. It's, not re it's not related to topical gags or anything else like that. And you'll also see something that somebody you know's done. Yeah, you can relate to the characters. <laughs> you, can relate, character. you can relate to the characters so well because you, you, know, you know you do it yourself. Some of the things, all right, it's exaggerated in the Laurel and Hardy film, but it's very, very close to reality. In the early days, they were there at the, the birth of, of sound. During the Hal Roach period, Laurel and Hardy appeared together in 32 silent films. With the introduction of sound in 1929, many movie comedians struggled with the transition to sound pictures, which, in effect, with some made their films weaker and a lot less funny. Laurel and Hardy did not have that problem. In fact, their films got better and funnier. Why did you get a veterinarian? Well, I didn't think his religion would make any difference. Not many of the silent actors of the time made it into the world of, of sound. And I think one of the reasons was they couldn't adapt the humour. However, fortunately for Stan, I think the main reason that he managed to do this was uh, the birth of Lois in 1927, which was about the time that silent films started. So if you think, five years later on, Around about 1932, when Lois is five, Stan's watching Lois play, Stan's watching Lois grow up, and his humour and his comedy changes, and it becomes more childlike in what he's doing. Oh, Ollie, I told you that I didn't want to talk to you. Not only did they make innovative use of the sound effects and dialogue sequences, their voices were perfect for the characters they portrayed on screen. Uh, my name is Mr. Hardy, and this is my very good friend, Mr. Laurel. Laurel and Hardy made the first talkie in 1929, and within the first 12 months, they totally understood the, the medium that they're working in. They made that transition so quickly, they don't overuse the... Uh, the, the, the dialogue, they just use it as punctuation for the visual gags and uh, it shows you what, just, just how Stan understood the, the, uh, the talking movies. Why don't we get one of those trailers to hook on the back of your car? Much better than the sleeping in the tent. 
The flies wouldn't Can bother you take us. one of those things into the mountains? Sure, right up in the high multitude. What do you think? We can't afford to buy one of those trailers. We don't have to buy one. We could rent one. I know a fellow that's got one for rent, and we could get it for next to nothing. I bet if we paid cash, we'd get it less than that. Very few of the silent um, comedians made it into sound because of the... They didn't understand the subtleties of it, but he did, and he used sound so well. There's a scene where Ollie hits Stan on the head, and it sounds like an empty bell. Also, he used it to his talent because he was able to use sound as like a bit where where uh, you know crash bang wallop. You know when you're looking there, there's a saucepan on, on Ollie's head or something like that. You know he's gone in there, um, and you makes it makes you believe they've actually done that, or he's, Ollie's gone through a cupboard or something like that. You know it amuses me actually if you watch Lauren Hardy films with Lauren Hardy fanatics like us, like the Sons of the Desert. How many times the laugh comes before the joke? Because everybody knows what's going to happen. And they start giggling because they know there's something funny going to happen any time now. And you know what's coming. And you're still laugh you're laughing before he even before he's in there because you know it's still funny. I watched Bratz today for the first time for a long time, actually, and giggled like a schoolgirl. I mean, I just giggled because it makes me laugh. They are so funny. And I love Bratz because they are, that, to me, Long and Hardy were, were children. You know, they, 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 every, most grown men, we're big kids at heart. You know, we are, we are big kids. We, we don't want to grow up and things like that. And Stan Laurel, a lot more Lauren Hardy, are big kids, basically. The main beauty about Stan Laurel is he can bring out the child in us all, especially me. And anybody who can do that and make me laugh, it's, it's got to be a genius. Isn't this silly? What? Here we are, two grown-up men acting like a couple of children. Why, we ought to be ashamed of ourselves throwing water at one another. Well, you started it. No, I didn't. Yes, you did. Well, I didn't. You certainly did. When we go to, to like, uh, the convention, when we go to a film show, it's great with an audience of 50 people. We're all with that lull and how do you know? We're all laughing. So we laugh more because you're in, it's in, so infectious. Laughter is infectious and that's their genius extra. He's always worth watching because he's always trying to do something creative in the background. You see the basic comedy, you see the basic funny part of the film. But the more you watch it, the subtleties that are going on behind camera, you know, like um, when they're in the shop and the guy's stealing everything out of the shop. How do you do? How do you do? And they are carrying on, totally oblivious to this man who's robbing them blind. How do you do? Who's that fella? Stan is a bit of a scene stealer because he's always doing little creative things. He find a funny way of doing it, um, whether it's running or walking or doing something with his hands. He find a normal way of doing it. 
and do it sort of like a funnier way of doing it. <laughs> Some of the best Lauren Hardy films, and some of my personal favourites, were based on the most simplest of ideas. Ideas like, what if the two of them build a boat? What if the two of them carry a heavy object up a flight of stairs? What if the two of them just clean a chimney? What do you want? Don't push it up until I tell you. And there's one part in this film, Liberty, uh, where Stan has a crab down the back of his trousers and it bites him and it's a certain part. And he sort of steps back and he goes forward again and it bites him again. And it has me in hysterics. I'm actually holding my stomach. A man that can make me laugh uncontrollably for a minute by simply eating an herb boiled egg has got to be a comedy genius. Not just eating a boiled egg but the way he eats a wax apple. Or the way he eats a flower while he's waiting to visit Ollie in hospital. To me, one of my favorite scenes is when um, he says to Ollie, who's now his butler, Ollie walks around the room, and, you know, put, put your stomach in, you know, like, if that tray, chin up. No, 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 both of them, both. My favourite scene at the moment is the, the soda scene uh, from Men of War. Not the, not, not the bit that most people maybe think of where my half is on the bottom, but that wonderful scene where the woman asks, Oh, General! Don't be a piker. So his face lights up and he says, All right, I'll have a banana split. And one of the favourite films amongst Sons of the Desert has got to be Laughing Gravy, based on the simple idea, two men, one dog, in a room together, trying to avoid a landlord, played by Charlie Hall. The end of Helpmates, for instance, when Stan is responsible for the total destruction of uh, Ollie's home. What happened? Well, I was all ready to leave and I thought I'd build a nice fire to make it comfortable for you. The house burned down and I Stan will say something quite simple and straightforward. I know how we could make a lot more money. How? Well, if, if we caught our own fish, we wouldn't have to pay for it. Then whoever we sold it to, it would be clear profit. And then Ollie will say... Tell me that again. Well, if, if you caught a fish, and whoever you sold it to, they wouldn't have to pay for it then the profits would they'd go to the fish if, uh, if you... Uh, expressions. I mean, the expressions on, on both their faces um, just makes you laugh. You look at Stan and, and he just does a silly grin or does stuff, and, and you just, just smile. As the Roach years came to close in 1940, Laurel and Hardy moved on to produce films for 20th Century Fox. 
It was at this point where Stan lost his control over the films. He simply had to obey the script and collect his paycheck. It's enough to make a man burst out crying. <laughs> After their film career came to a close, Stan continued to write Laurel and Hardy sketches. Some were performed live on stage during their various tours they did and proved very popular. On the 7th of August 1957, after suffering a long illness, Stan's comedy partner, Oliver Hardy, passed away. This was to bring the end of the work of Laurel and Hardy. Stan retired but did not disappear out of the public eye altogether. When he retired, he still left his name in the phone book so that people could ring him. For example, Norman Wisdom, where does he live? Oh, he's in the phone book. <laughs> Give him a ring, go around and chat to him. And whether you were well known or whether you were unknown, Stan always was me, he always had time for people. After all, he died, as we know, Stan retired, he had lots of um, offers to work but many of the uh, comedians of that day went to visit Stan. Um, there was Dick Van Dyke, Jerry Lewis, and from England, Peter Sellers and Tony Hancock. Um, they all wanted to, I think, be in the presence of the great uh, comedian uh, and for a little bit of his comic genius to rub off on them, and, you know, in some cases it did. Stan Laurel was forever a comedian, right up to the moment he died. Stan was lying in his bed and the nurse was visiting him and uh, asked how he was. Stan's reply was, well, I wish I was skiing. The nurse said, I didn't know you could ski, Mr. Laurel. And he replied, I can't ski, but I would rather be skiing than lying here. Stan passed away on the 23rd of February, 1965. You remember once you were telling me that when we passed away, we'd come back on this earth in some other form, like a bird or a dog or a horse or something. Oh, you mean reincarnation? Yeah, yeah, that's it. Well, now that we're going to go, what would you like to be when you come back? I don't know. I've never given it much thought. I like horses. I guess I'd like to come back as a horse. Huh. What would you like to be when you come back? Oh, I'd rather come back as myself. I always got along swell with me. We are the son of the dead. In 1965, Stan's biographer, John McCabe, had the wonderful idea to create a fan club dedicated to the work of Laurel and Hardy. Together with the assistance of Al Kilgore and Chuck McCann, and endorsed by Stan himself just several months before his death, the Laurel and Hardy Appreciation Society was established. Named after one of their greatest feature films, the organisation took the name The Sons of the Desert. This is a fun organisation in which fans of all ages from all over the world get together to celebrate and relive the work of Stan and Ollie. Conventions and other events are held every year. Laurel and Hardy's films, are, they're all coming up 80 years old. How do 80-year-old films still make four-year-olds laugh today? It's, it, it's almost inconceivable that anything from today will still be remembered by huge amounts of people in, in 80 years time. He's looked on today by a lot of the modern day alternative comedians as the first and the best and he's held in such high regard still when you think how long after his death people still love Laurel and Hardy. If you talk to the comedians today if they talk about their roots they will go back to, to Laurel and Hardy. You still see Stan Laurel's ideas coming through in modern day comedy. Modern sitcom writers, Ricky Gervais, Graham Linehan from the, the IT crowd and, and Father Ted, and they talk about the rules of sitcom. And they talk about how they still abide by the same rules that Laurel and Hardy invented in the, the, the 1930s and 40s. And if he wasn't such a genius, we wouldn't still be watching the films 80 years on. We still wouldn't be meeting once a month to sit and laugh at the films and we certainly wouldn't be going to conventions. And to go for 80 years and, and still produce something still funny and you've seen thousands and thousands of times and you still laugh, it, it's got, got to be genius, it can't, can't be anything else.
It's almost 80 years now since Laurel and Hardy made their final film for Hal Roach, but yet their humour lives on eternally. Laurel and Hardy were and will always be, in my mind, the best comedy partnership team ever. The films don't appear on television anymore, but yet their timeless, innocent humour continues to attract new audiences of all ages and cultures. You might be an accountant to a, a, to a dustman and you know, I was a market trader, you know, and all this one thing, this one combination that, that, that brings everybody together is, is, is this, this comedy of this genius of Stan Novel. <laughs> I wish I could have met him and, and go back and actually say to him, this is what you've created, this Sons of the Desert, this is what you created and this is how people love you. They were meant to be together, they really were. 80 years on and they're still making the world laugh. Thank you, Mr. Laurel. The fact that they are enjoyed just as much now as they were in the 1920s and 30s, and from the dedicated loyalty of the Sons of the Desert is evidence to prove that they are still very much alive today. So isn't this proof enough then? To say, Stan Laurel, you were, without question, a comedy genius. Thank you. We sure used to have a lot of fun, didn't we? We sure did. You remember how dumb I used to be? Yeah. Well, I'm better now. Well, I'm certainly glad to hear it. Stan Laurel, a master of comedy. His genius in the art of humour brought gladness to the world he loved.